Alrighty, well, good morning, everybody. And it's time once again for my pseudo cast. And uh, this time around, hey, I actually found a good, uh, I actually found a good, uh, a good, uh, a good picture. And I found the, uh, the actual proper sound of Pluto. Um, and this time I actually got kind of lucky. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the other videos that have Pluto sounds, they all sound pretty much the same. Like, there's no, None of these had like extra ASMR or extra ambient crap attached to them, so so this is one of the rare ones. Um, but otherwise, uh, just let me go ahead and get get into this. And I'm pro I might have to make uh, adjustments to this too. Oh yeah, this is like a goop, a goopy as hell sound, man. Um, apparently this planet here is mostly ice and rock, so why it's um uh, why it's red, I have no idea. And Lord knows where the hell, and Lord knows where the hell the sound's coming from, or why Pluto is giving off this kind of kind of sound. But like I said, it's it's um uh, it's mostly ice and rock. I. I think this might actually be a. I think it might be enhanced color too. I think I remember reading it somewhere, but like I said, every uh, every image of Pluto that I've seen looks just like this, so it's just what I'm going with. And uh, yes, I'm gonna have to turn that down. Um, but otherwise, I don't really have a whole lot to talk about. Um, I, for the most part, I just dawdled around. Uh, just sat on my butt just watching stuff. Oh, 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 wait, 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 let me stop. Um, I'm gonna crack open a can of V8 Energy Peach Mango flavored. So, get ready for some pops. Uh, but but uh, otherwise I watched uh, like yesterday um, I li or as I said yesterday I listened to I listened to a new artist named Kid Koala um, it's his his uh, his was his debut studio album um, Carpal Tunnel Syndrome I mean I, I absolutely loved it oh my god um, and I love it enough to where it's it's going to be pretty close to my top five, top five favorite albums. Right now, where I have it is, it's a tie for fifth between that and um, Diggable Planets reaching. So, there, there, it's a, again, it's a two-way tie for fifth. But, uh, this time around, I listened to his, uh, his very, very first, uh, it's not an actual album, it's just a demo. But yeah, that that really that really set the tone for uh for the kind of the kind of musician he is. For those that don't know, he's he's a he's a turntable DJ. He uses uh he uses three turn three turntables. He also uses like uh these little their little sampling boxes or their little uh oh little these little soundboards. Like he'll push button, he'll push a button, it'll make a sound, that kind of thing. I think he has a couple of these as well. But yeah, I watched a, I watched a little bit of his uh his live stuff. It's pretty it's pretty neat. He's actually it's almost like he's trying to spin plates up there, trying to keep as many plates spinning as possible because it's like he's uh he's spending almost as much time changing records, changing records and playing them as he is actually you know doing their. The bricker, 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 bricker stuff. Um, but uh, I I should probably mention this first. But um, just I'm still watching um uh, I'm still watching Amoeba videos, just various musicians going through Amoeba records and then you know and then mm, buying various record CDs, coffee mugs and whatnot, and then talking to the Amoeba staff. 
um, about what they got and why, and they're filming this whole entire thing. It's really neat to watch, but um, and uh, I'm as a kind of a special added bonus, um, I'm I'm checking out all these new artists that I've never even heard of, and this is coming from somebody whose favorite band is The Residents. So going on going off of that, there's um. Amoeba has artists going through their doors that even I've never heard of. And again, uh, Kid Koala and a new one, Jessica Pratt. She's a she's a folk artist, kind of like Joni Mitchell. And yes, I do enjoy listen. I do like folk music, not all of it, not every single you know, not every single artist or anything. But you know, yeah, I like me some folk music. I also like listening to Guar, Pantera, Ministry. D aside, etc., etc., too. So, no, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a folk music fiend or anything like that. So, but, but, um, I'm uh, listening to Jessica Pratt's self-titled album. I'm like, damn, I think she's probably the only folk, the only folk musician I could think of. Who does nothing? Who does nothing but acoustic guitar? And I, I can actually listen to her entire album all the way through. Um, I think Joel, Joel was one. Um, uh, Joel, Joni Mitchell. Um, there was another one. Oh God, names on the tip of my tongue. Tori Amos, kinda. But uh, all of them, um, when I when I listen to their when I listen to their music. If, if if most of their album is nothing but just them and their guitar and that's it, uh, it actually drives me up a freaking wall. Like there's there's got to be a rhythm section, you know, drums, bass in the background. I mean, I I take that. I mean, I'll take whatever they can give, you know. But I I can't. I mean, I, it really drives me batty when it's just when it's just somebody and an acoustic guitar and that's it. I mean, I can handle it for a while, but eventually I end up tapping out and crying, Uncle. But not Jessica Pratt. I, I part of I mean, part of it might be her voice. I mean, part of that, and I mean, part of that too is it's just. It might also be due to the fact that uh, her, this uh, her self-titled debut came out in 2012, and it sounds like a damn 60s hippie record. Like, you know, 60s folk music. It sounds just like that. So I found that... that I find that kind of mind-blowing. But uh, on the other hand, uh, now that I think about it, I think Henry Rollins is right. Uh, uh, new or good music that just came out exists. Yeah, he... Uh, me or him and up until, up until now, to a lesser extent, me... Um, we're, I mean, I was, uh, I was pretty much against modern music, especially around the time Auto-Tune came out. I mean, back then, I was like this too. Any music that came out after, like, late 90s, I guess, it just automatically sucked by default. Because, uh, people lean too heavily on Auto-Tune, or lean too heavily on Pro Tools and, you know, the, the slick recording methods and, you know, stuff like that. But, uh... Once I started up, uh, once I started playing vinyl, this uh, this actually cooled off some. I, I don't I don't really know why, but uh, I had less of the modern music sucks, mental you know mentality. Um, but part of that let me let me rewind a little bit. Part of that, part of that is also due to the fact of me uh, getting my job at Walmart like 15 years ago, uh, where, for I'd probably say. 14 out of those 15 years was spent listening to Walmart radio where they play whatever's trendy, whatever's popular they always got the new stuff playing or they basically play all things mainstream so this um, this didn't really help me shed the modern music sucks mentality so I mean I'm having to hear it every day but uh, otherwise yeah um, but it, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much like Henry Rollins now. I mean, good, you know, good music does exist these days. 
even even if it's modern. I mean, it, you know, I mean, yes, and again, as coming from somebody who's who's uh, worked at Walmart for 15 years, and even to the, you know, and still working there to this day, yeah, good music still does exist. I mean, it's not all. Hey now, you're an all-star. Get your game on. Go play. You know, or. I love you like a love song, baby. I say beep, 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 beep. I mean, I mean, yeah, there's that kind of shit out there. But there's also good, you know, there's also good stuff, you know, like, like the aforementioned, aforementioned Jessica Pratt. I mean, she's not, she's not super modern. I mean, like I said, her self-titled debut came out in like 2012. But yet, if you, if I had, if, if I played this record, if I played this album for you, you never would have knew this. You would have thought, like I did, that this was like a it was like a '60s folk record. But nope, uh, 2010s. Uh, another one. I mean, you know, there was another modern one. Um, uh, one of uh Les Claypool's uh, many projects, Duo de Twang. I mean, that that's a pretty awesome album, and I think it came out somewhere in the 2010s. But uh, I mean, I mean, technically it's not modern, modern, but for all intents and purposes, close enough. You know, but I mean, my, but I mean, going back, you know, back, you know, going back to what I was saying, yeah, I like folk music. Not all of it, but I, I do like my share. Oh, um, the other, the other folk artist I was thinking, Ani DeFranco. I think, with the exception of her first album. Her first album, it was all acoustic guitar and her, and that's it. But luckily, the way... She... How can I explain this? She's almost percussive with the way she plays, uh... With the way she plays her acoustic guitar. Like, I want to say she's almost playing it like a bass. Where it's less about solo and more about, you know, keeping a steady rhythm. So she's kind of an outlier in that, whereas, uh... Most other folk, uh, folk artists that I listen to, it's uh, it's just mostly melodic and not rhythmic. So, but uh, like from her, I don't have her second album. Um, oh god, I think it was her. Uh, I want to say it was her. Her out of range album was when she started having a backing band. Uh, she had a. I think his name's Andy Stokansky or something like that. He's the drummer. I think she had a bass player. I, I want to say she had a bass player in there. I can't remember, but but anyway, she's like, <clears throat> she's probably like one of the one of the few folks. Think she's one of the like like just like Pratt, Audie DeFranco's probably one of the one of the few folkies where I could pro I could tolerate her just her and her guitar. Yeah, um, but otherwise, uh, for the, in case anyone's curious, my uh, my favorite genre of music is jazz. But again, just like folk, not all jazz. I mean, generally speaking, if you threw on any kind of jazz on the turntable or on the CD player, I'm cool with it. But I, but as far as for uh, as far as for me personally, I mean, there's, I mean, there's there's type, I mean, there's I don't want to say bad jazz, but there is there. I've heard some jazz that just kind of went in one ear and out the other, like just didn't do anything for me. But again, in the if you know if we're if we're if I was at your place, if we were in public or something, you could probably throw just about any jazz album on there, and I'll be cool with it. So. But. Aside from that, I listen to most anything except most country, most rap music, and most pop music. Now, one thing I one thing I um not one thing I do uh I do just now I just now remember too. Um back 
before I started uh, before I started collecting vinyl, it used to be just like some other people, uh, anything but country and rap. For the longest time, I used to be one of those people as well. I was some anything, some country and rap. But uh, again, once I started my vinyl collection, now it's most country, most rap, and most pop music. Because I have found that there's some good country out there. Not much, but it, it it's out there. Um, um, there's you know there's some good rap music out there. Not a whole lot of it, but it, it exists. Uh, same with pop music. I mean, actually, now that I think about it too, um, probably one of my all-time favorite songs, uh, "Canary in a Coal Mine" by The Police. It's very much a me song. You'd have to you'd have to listen to the lyrics in order to know what I mean. Especially if you are, especially if you knew me personally, you'd be like, "Yep." That's him. Yep, that's him. But uh, Walmart is actually playing that song every day now, and I'm beginning to get tired of it. But uh, but this is this is what working in these kind of places will, will happen. It's, it's what'll happen to you. You know, songs that you you thought were just totally awesome, you'll end up hating because the the place you're working, they'll they'll start playing that song at your at your job, and you'll end up hearing it every single day, every single day, and twice on Sunday. And eventually, you get tired of hearing it. And there's been a there's been a fair amount of songs that I've liked that have or that have gone that route. I used to love them. Now I hate them. That's the good old Clockwork Orange effect for you. But yeah, now that I think about it, you know, it's really weird that a that a planet like Pluto that doesn't look doesn't look very very busy, for lack of a better word, you know, it just looks like a a red a red and brown rock that actually makes this kind of noise. But then you look at a planet like uh like Saturn or Jupiter that um. Uh, you can tell by look. You can tell by looking that it looks like there's a whole lot of shit going on there. There's a whole lot of activity, but yet, all it really sounds like is like. You know, or, or you know, sounds really quiet. Whereas, uh, this big old, this big old reddish brown rocker has, you know, like has some really fucked up sounds to it. It's like that, um. Um, it's like that, um, on yesterday's pseudocast, I had the, I had the moon, Io. I mean, other than the fact that it's like a, it basically looks like a big old round block of Swiss cheese with a little bit of, with a little bit of mold on it. It, it actually, it actually makes all these, all kinds of weird goopy sounds, but otherwise it just basically looks like a, just a big old yellow rock. But yet, it makes all these fucked up noises. Same thing with this planet. I would have thought a, a planet like Uranus and Neptune, which are just blue balls. <laughs> okay, that didn't come out. That didn't come out right, but you know what I mean. You know, just big old blue spheres. You know, they just look like there won't be a whole lot of activity going on. But, but no, you. I think uh, I think it was Neptune. It was just. I mean, it just makes all kinds of windy noise. I think last I looked, it was uh, Uranus and or Neptune that had a that literally has 1,500 mile an hour winds. That's like a one. You'd be getting one hell of a blowjob if you visited those places. <laughs> oh, and um, I forgot to mention too. I also watched uh, episode 12 of Dragon Ball, and like part of the episode is um. Uh, the the evil ba evil bad guy emperor got a hold of all seven dragon balls and now he he summoned the dragon and wanted to make his wish but um I guess Oolong uh the uh the he's a he's a pig a little a little midget pig he uh 
push the Emperor up right when the Emperor was saying his wish. The, um, Oolong pushes the model away. I wish for a comfortable underwear! And like all of a sudden this... Your wish is granted. And this pair of women's underwear drops down on his face. So, it seems the writers have a women's underwear fetish. And like the rest of the episode, Oolong sitting there wearing the women's underwear on his head. So like, damn man, it's like... You know, I want to. I want to say, man. You know. You know, it's like the it's like the writers are all a bunch of pedo pervs. On one hand, I think I want to say, you know, they really need to stage an intervention for these guys. But on the other hand, I want to say this stuff's pretty revolutionary. You know, and I think uh, some of the stuff that I've seen so far in the first season of Dragon Ball, I think it predates stuff like South Park, uh, Family Guy. Rick and Morty, etc. You know, just, I mean, I've only seen the very first, the pilot episode of Rick and Morty, so I know very little about it, but I get that impression. Uh, South Park, I, I played the, I played the pinball machine back in the 90s, so I have kind of an inkling as to how the, as to how it works. I also watched the speed run on a, it's like a South Park RPG. I don't know the actual name of it. Like the the, ma the magic stick of truth or something like that. So I, I've seen enough of them to kind of to know that it's it's some pretty juvenile humor. Kind of like what um kind of like the stuff I'm seeing in Dragon Ball. So but like like I said, so you know, but it's from the from what I've seen of this first season. They're I think they kind of set the tone for these kind of shows. You know, Rick and Morty, Family Guy, and South Park, and there there might have been others too, but I I can't remember what they are. So. But alrighty, um, I'm just I've pretty much said all the things I wanted to say this morning, so I'll just go ahead and call it good here. Um, but thanks for. Thanks a lot for tuning in and listening to me, everybody. I appreciate that. And uh, I should be able to do another one of these tomorrow morning. So, But until then, thanks again for coming around, guys. And see you all next time. Take care.